Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. And before we jump into today's show, I wanted to pause for just a moment and thank you all for helping us get to the 50 episode mark. Holy shit, that is a lot of cocktail audio content. Most podcasts fizzle and die out long before they get this far, and I can say with confidence that it's our listeners and your really kind, enthusiastic feedback that have kept us on the hunt for great interviews and quality deep dives on the subjects you care about. So for me and the rest of the Modern Bar Cart team, Thank you for all your support. We've got no intention of slowing down, so continue to expect really great stuff as we grow and evolve as a company in 2018 and beyond. This week's episode is actually part one of a two-part interview with friend of the pod, Jordan Wicker. Jordan knows a great deal about bourbon, and you'll learn why when we jump into the interview. During this episode, we cover a lot of bourbon history and label claims, and in the part two, which will air next week, we conduct an in-depth tasting of five different selections with different proofs and mash bills, kind of walk you through tasting some different bourbons. But before we start the interview, I'd like, of course, to give you the chance to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is actually a repeat. I know, I know, it's it's such a cop-out, but there's a reason why I'd like to quickly review some notes on the Old Fashioned. As most of you know, the Old Fashioned is sort of the quintessential bourbon cocktail. And to make one, we all know you need two ounces of bourbon, one sugar cube, or a half ounce of simple syrup, and several dashes of aromatic bitters. We like to use our very own embitterment aromatic bitters when we make old fashions. And, you know, very easy drink to make, but there are a few reminders and tips I'd like to provide here to help you take your old fashioned to the next level. Tip number one, pick your sweetness wisely. If you do decide to use a sugar cube, which is actually how I prefer to make them, remember you wanna make sure that you add a splash of filtered water to the mixing pint when you muddle that sugar with the bitters. This is important because that little splash of water is gonna help get the sugar dissolving before you add the ice and the booze, both of which will actively inhibit the dissolving of the sugar. This is why simple syrup is great to have on hand, especially if you're batching, Uh, you know, the syrup being pre-dissolved and so it's easier to make a well-balanced drink with it. But not impossible with the sugar, just remember, add that little splash of water and kind of grind it around and you know get a slurry going before you add your ice and your bourbon. Tip number two, be mindful of temperature. If you wanna sip your old fashioned slowly and really savor it without it you know warming up or the ice dissolving too much, I'd recommend two things. One, go for larger, smoother ice cubes or even spheres to optimize temperature against melting rate. And also consider pre-chilling your rocks glass beforehand. One thing you don't wanna chill for any reason is your mixing glass, especially if you plan on using a real sugar cube, which goes back to exactly what we were talking about in tip number one. And then finally, remember, the bitters really matter. I know this sounds a bit biased coming from a guy who makes bitters, but think about it. In an old fashioned, you've only got really one ingredient besides the spirit that's gonna do a lot of work on the flavor front. So there's one really golden opportunity to explore and experiment with the relatively blank slate that is the old fashioned, and that's by swapping out and playing around with your bitters. We've got eight different flavors and even a bitters variety pack available on modernbarcart.com. So head on over and check out those offerings from Embitterment if you want some inspiration. And now back to the interview. In this episode, some of the specific topics Jordan and I discuss include how he began his love affair with bourbon and how a twist of fate put him in regular contact with an expert distiller. 
the origin story of bourbon, including how it got its name, how it overtook rye whiskey as America's sweetheart spirit, and why it's so popular today. How to use label claims like straight bourbon whiskey and bottled in bond to determine if you're looking at a quality product at the liquor store. A few notes on bourbon distilling trends over the years, a little tangent about chartreuse, and much, much more. If you're a bourbon nerd, or if you're someone who's looking to expand your bourbon collection on a budget, then this episode is definitely for you. We get pretty granular, and there's some great takeaways that'll give you confidence the next time you go to make a purchase. So right now, I invite you to mix yourself up a nice old-fashioned and enjoy part one of this deep dive on bourbon, courtesy of our friend, Jordan Wicker. Jordan Wicker, I don't get to say this a whole hell of a lot, but welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, I think I'm becoming the most, uh, the biggest pest on your show. (laughs) (laughs) For folks who are not familiar, definitely check out episode numero uno of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast, uh, The Joys of Home Bartending, where we sit down with Alex here and his uh, partner in crime, sorry, Jordan here and his (laughs) partner in crime, Alex. And then there's also the iconic vodka episode, uh, which gets a lot of attention. So uh, <laughs> check out check out those episodes if you want another an, another little taste of Jordan Wicker after this one. But um, can you just give us the quick LinkedIn bio of who you are, or what you do? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll I'll do it on the on the drinks and and bourbon side. Like you mentioned, Alex and I uh, had a show. I'm gonna put it in the past tense, even though. We're not sure it's completely dead yet. The the Speaking Easy podcast for for two years. There's 106 episodes out there, so go find them. And that all started from a hobbyist place. It actually all began with, coincidentally, uh, an oversupply of bourbon in my house and got into cocktail making and over some drinks, uh, decided that it would be good to turn it into a substantial hobby and not just a, a drinking habit. And since then, have uh, gotten published in a few spots, so we're proud of that, uh, both Alex and I, and have learned a ton, and now people like you are confused enough to think that we're experts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I do want to point out, and we're going to put um, some links in the show notes, but the Speaking Easy podcast is out there. It's free, just like the Modern Bar Cart podcast. In fact, listening to these guys was you know, one of the first things that kind of got me into thinking about launching this podcast because I would go to work in my cubicle before I quit my day job and just kind of get jealous of the things that these guys were piping into my headphones. And so, you know, it was kind of almost an impetus for me to get out from behind my cubicle and into the real world of cocktails here. So check out the Speaking Easy podcast. I I really like that you and Alex kind of feed off each other. We, we get a lot of guests, like, mm-hmm. you know, we're interviewing you right now, but uh, you guys have a really great rapport. And I think one of the best parts about that podcast for me is listening to, like kind of getting to know both of you guys in the relationship yeah. back and forth. Well, that's, I mean, that's really where it got started. We were and continued to be a- amateur cocktail nerds. And it, it got to a point where we were throwing cocktail parties and using each other for uh, extra hands because you get 10 or 12 people in your house wanting cocktails sometimes you're you get weighed down as a host by by just being behind the bar so we started doing that and uh, like you mentioned our our conversations would be sometimes funny or enjoyable or almost satiric because we're kind of odd couple-ish two, <laughs> two, very di- two very different personalities but it was interesting because what we found out too though was a lot of the time our prefer our drink preferences were were very close. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Alex was de- is definitely much more the the home do it yourselfer. I'm much more the classics and I'll buy my ingredients kind of guy. Um, certainly dabble on the other side, but he really he really took that uh, to a whole new level. And again, we I think we complemented each other well and continue to, but just not recording our conversations anymore. <laughs> sure, for sure. Well, there's a hundred and what, six of them? A hundred, so, 106 episodes. Yeah, yeah. There, there, that has to be several days worth of content, uh, yeah, if no, not close to a week. And I, and I don't know what the actual average of recording time is, but I think they're all, uh, they're in anywhere between 30 minutes for some of the episodes that are just Alex and I up to I think we've got an hour and a half is probably the longest with an interview. Yeah. Um, but yeah. 
commutable uh, conversations. For sure. So again, links in the show notes, but we are here tonight talking about, thinking about, and drinking about something I've been putting off. And it's weird that I've put it off this long because it's actually one of the most popular and widespread spirits in the age spirits category. It's, it's bourbon whiskey. And, you know, as I was trying to rack my brain for, for what distiller can I, uh, you know, come and get, you know, take away from their stills long enough to explain this process to us and the, just the, the whole sweep of, of bourbon culture. And I, I think it actually works better that it's you and I, because you've kind of got, you, you understand the distillation side pretty intimately because of your, you know, yeah. you know, your family, um, your upbringing, which yeah. we can kind of yeah, talk we'll, about. Yeah, we'll dive into that piece too. Um, but then you also understand like the, the brutal liquor store reality yeah. uh, of like, all right, what's it, what, what is bullshit? What's not? So can you kind of talk to, talk to our listeners about how you came to know so much about bourbon? Okay. Yeah. Great place to start because it really is sort of the advent of my interest in, in all things drinking, drinking culture. It really wasn't until after undergrad, I was, I was in law school at the time that I, I got introduced to bourbon in, in, a, in a real way. And that started with my brother-in-law. He's a Kentucky native and uh, a professional chef. And I was living in Chicago at the time. He and my sister were, were up there too. And it, it was almost learning by osmosis. It was what was around. It was what he wanted to provide me. It was what he wanted to teach me about. And of course, I was a, a willing drinker. So it really, it really got started there. And then uh, I moved from Chicago to DC and didn't have that mentor. So I started collecting. I started buying. And early on, collecting just means that you're not finishing a bottle before you buy your next one. And, and so I wasn't, I wasn't getting a lot of nice things. I think I got a couple of bottles for my, my graduation that were, were top shelf, uh, select occasion kind of things, but really started building out a, a lower tier uh, level of, uh, of, of bottles, things that are 20 to $40. Mm-hmm. And it got to a point where the, I had too many of those bottles on my shelf and I did still have the sip, the nice sippers on the top shelf. And I realized I needed more than one way or two ways to drink my, my whiskey. And, and that's what really the advent of my cocktail interest. Granted, my brother-in-law and other influences have helped me along the way with the culinary side and the, the concept side of, of cocktails. But really, that's where it starts out. And then serendipitously, my mom actually had moved to Kentucky for wine business. This is probably seven years ago now. And... Um, in the wild way that careers and professions change and morph, she uh, ended up finding herself in a whiskey distillery and ended up falling in love with the whiskey distillation, the bourbon distillation specifically. And uh, now she's a distiller and has distilled for a few different places, but has done, has almost always had, oh, actually has always had a whiskey on her on her portfolio. So that's kind of where. The, the extreme or, or higher than average knowledge on the distillation side has come in. And it's actually helped me in a big way because my mom's palate is uh, infinitely sh- stronger, more perceptive than mine. And so anytime I, I sit down with a glass with her, I, I, I pick her brain on what it is I'm tasting and why I'm tasting it. So going back to the distillation process, why is it that that I get this flavor over that flavor or or that sort of thing? Is it is it part of the mash bill? Is it part of the aging? Is it somebody screwed up? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> those, those sorts of things. Yeah, is it a, is it a feature or is it a bug? <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and she's really good at pointing out the bugs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, that's good. It's it's interesting that she came to to whiskey from a wine background. I, I imagine that has just a huge influence on her palate and the way that she probably talks about flavor. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I think that um, uh, whether by accident or by nature, it's, uh, she she has excelled at, at the distillation process. And I think part of it's because she started strictly with fermentation. You you notice imperfections there a lot quicker and a lot sooner, and in the end product, in a way that. Um, it takes longer and sometimes can be masked differently with a distilled product. The on the on the knowledge side, uh, I think that it's one of those things that is a product of the 
craft spirits, beer, whatever boom is that there's just a huge lack of, of skilled work in that space. There are very few people who've done it for a decade. And, sure. and my mom is, my mom is under a decade and is still kind of uh, rising to the top of her field. There's, I think that there's some component of that where she had, and, and she was also a winemaker in Kentucky where they, at the time, I don't know if this law has changed, but they couldn't distill or no, they couldn't ferment by law grains and fruit on the same premises. Mm -hmm. And so she started fermenting fruit cause she was doing wine but then creating joint brandy projects. So she'd go to the, she'd take her fermented grapes and go to the distillery and have it uh, distilled into brandy. And, and really that's where her distilling got started was on the brandy side. Right. And then, and then again, the, the funny way things happen in, in careers, uh, she went over to the grain side and uh, it's been a little while, I think, since she's done a brandy a couple of years now, but uh, I, who knows? Maybe she'll go back to it. For sure. So we kind of have a sense of the influences behind the man, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got a, you've had quite a while now to, you know, work your way through the bourbons. We were even talking off mic here. You, you, you regularly kind of self-educate, attend lectures, mm -hmm. events, various like trade festivals. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, that's one thing too. I, obviously, my, my foundation is in bourbon. And uh, I love all things American whiskey, and I love just about everything whiskey in general. And uh, lucky to live in Washington, D.C. with several whiskey bars, including Jack Rose, which has the largest uh, accessible collection um, in North America. And uh, it's not uncommon to find me at the bar with a flight tasting through things that I haven't had before or things that I've had before um, mm -hmm. and, and taking taking notes. And I mean, I learned I learned Japanese whiskey that way mm -hmm. uh, just by going in on several occasions and having several drinks each occasion and right. talking to the bartender about it. And luckily that the place is like a library and the bartenders are like librarians. They, they know what they've got behind on the shelf and uh, they can tell you about it. So resources like that are, are, are great. And again, I'm at the end of the day, I'm just a a smart consumer. Uh, <laughs> like I, I, I'm, I'm not in the industry and I, I'm not an expert by any means, but, uh, I've, I've tasted quite a few. Well, and that's, I mean, that's important. They say like, you know, you become an expert after 10,000 hours of something and you know, you become an expert in a, a spirit or a, a category in a way after tasting, you know, several yeah. you know, hundreds or thousands of different variations mm -hmm. on it, I think in the same way. So we're going to jump in now and let's do it this way because we know that there's other types of whiskey. We know there's Scotch whiskey, there's rye whiskey, there's Japanese whiskey, there's other popular types of whiskey out there. Forgive the dog barking, if you can hear him. Probably can't, the signal noise ratio is great on this, but um, <laughs> otherwise it just sounds like, it's like you ever see the uh, comic Garfield without, without Garfield? It's literally no. just John Arbuckle acting like an insane man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up now. Yeah, it's, that's the experience that the listeners are having right now. Yeah. But bourbon, we're isolating that this episode. If you had to pitch bourbon to investors who didn't know bourbon, how would you pitch bourbon? Ooh, Because I know you love it. Yeah. So I want to give you the chance to gush about it a little bit and kind of show it in its best possible form. Yeah. So that's an, I mean, that's an excellent question. Never a role I've been, been put in before and slightly different than the question that was prefaced to me in the email before the show. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll take a swing at it. Um, I was enlightened on my walk over here. No, fair enough. Put me in the salesman's bot. Um, getting started, what I'd say is, is that if you're going through the full marketing thing, it has, it has a history and it has a history that people can attach to. Well, it's, it's a drink that, like many things that are now specialized and 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 gourmet, uh, it has very simple roots, and it has and and the reason for it, its existence is is a very organic and natural one. We're talking specifically about bourbon, but you cannot have a conversation about American whiskeys without saying that the foundation is rye. Mm -hmm. uh, American whiskey started with rye, and and as the country moved west the grains available changed and then great opportunities happened when um, the heaviest drinking city America has ever known, New Orleans, started running low on cognac. And 
and that's really where where bourbon um, finds its opportunity. And honestly, the story that I like best about where bourbon gets its name is not the a lot of folks think of New Orleans and Bourbon Street. I think that's incidental. I think what happened, and this is one of those theories that's out there, and I think it has the most legs, is that the barrels of American whiskey coming out of Kentucky were labeled bourbon because that's where they were headed. They were headed to Bourbon Street. They were headed to New Orleans. And, and so then you had a bunch of barrels coming down river with with bourbon written on them. And so the name becomes the drink, and, and, and then the drink's all we remember. So... And and again, it's it's got the it's got the same historical sort of roots as as American rye, and that all comes from a history that's across the ocean. It, it comes from Scotch and Irish um, uh, whiskey distillers uh, who who migrated over here and and brought their distilling craft with them. They were frontiersmen. They were I mean, they were in Pittsburgh when Pittsburgh was Western United States, and then they moved forward through Kentucky and Tennessee and. That's when what was plentiful in, in Pennsylvania, which was rye, turned into what was plentiful in Kentucky and Tennessee, which was corn. And, and then you have the, the mash bills changing over from majority rye to majority corn. And you get these softer, sweeter notes, oftentimes uh, so a little bit more honey, a little bit more caramel sometimes. Than, uh, and again, a lot of these mash bills are, are 60% corn or 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 uh, with rye, sixty uh, percent rye, or you get a high rye, but the flavor profiles are very similar. But but if you ha- have something that's a high corn versus a high rye, you really know the difference. And mm-hmm. I, I think that that's one thing too that I can't sell. If you're really trying to become an educated drinker in the whiskey space or any space in general, on especially aged spirits, is visiting distilleries because you often get to taste the unaged spirit. Mm-hmm. And the best place for anybody to really hone in on the flavors and the differences between a, a high corn bourbon and a high rye rye whiskey is is that unaged spirit, and, right. and you get those uh, you get those rye bread notes with a rye. You get the you get again the the corn bread and corn and and sweetness and honey off of uh, off of the bourbon and. So I, I, this is a long-winded sales pitch, and I, I think my commercial has already <laughs> ended. But um, yeah, you're not you're not exactly but, the Billy Mays. We no, need, no, I'm. I, I, you, you. You, you gave me a, an opportunity to wax poetic, and I'm not very poetic, so now I'm just talking. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's the quintessential American spirit. It again, it's born out of uh, ingenuity and opportunity, and especially for those who, if somebody is not a fan of the earthy and smoky nature of a lot of old world whiskeys uh, and, and and rye is not smoky but it is it is spicier and it is earthier at times uh, bourbon is a an, a great a great opportunity to to find a whiskey you love right it's a great entry point it's it's definitely a, a lot mellower than most ryes tend to be you know I, I think you gestured earlier toward some of the bleed over between a high rye bourbon and a you know mm-hmm. like a, a high oh you yeah know, you corn have, rye you have you have places like um, High West and uh, are they in Utah out west um, that specialize I mean they've made some beautiful beautiful whiskeys that are right on the border of 50 50 they actually have a 50 mm-hmm. 50 whiskey that's burr rye it's not bourbon and it's not rye because it's actually 50 percent of each and for either one to be one or the other it's got to be majority uh, right. plus one so right the other thing that i i thought of I, I was recently at sagamore distilling which is a rye company based in baltimore and and the defining distinction between uh, Pennsylvania, traditional Pennsylvania rye whiskey and Maryland rye whiskey, both states mm. having a pretty, you know, solid rye heritage is that in Maryland, they did add corn and in Pennsylvania, they, they didn't. Mm-hmm. So it's really interesting. What, what really struck me, and it, I, f- I feel like it's crazy that I didn't know this before this conversation, but just that, yeah, bourbon happened when we moved West, just a little, not mm-hmm. even like a lot, like not even all the way. Yeah. Bourbon happened when we moved just a little west, and the soil changed, and we could cultivate corn a little bit more effectively. And I got to imagine what you were talking about with New Orleans was the phylloxera blight. Uh, so all I, I, I don't know specifically what happened. All I know is that at, at some point there was a, 
cognac became inaccessible to New Orleans. They were not getting the shipments from France that they were uh, used to, and I don't know what the cause. I don't, to be honest, I don't remember the historical cause of why they weren't, but it was a big deal, and that's why you have. I mean, that's why you have a lot of classic drinks, and we'll talk about a few. Or I, I plan to talk about a few later. Yeah, for sure. That the original cocktail was a was a brandy or a cognac cocktail, and it turned into a rye cocktail. And now it's a bourbon cocktail, and right. and and it's all because of what was available and what was close. Yeah. And and again, I I mean I can go into a couple of opportunities. Rye has definitely had its, its day, especially through bartenders recently, and, and the boom of uh, I think we're at Pax Cocktail at, at the moment. But uh, um, the opportunities Rye had to be America's quintessential spirit are are similar to those of rum. Rum had a real opportunity to be the spirit of the Americas and, and North America included. And because of larger factors at play, it didn't. And and now we think of bourbon as, as, as that. And a lot of times we think of it as a Kentucky only thing, which it's, which it's not, but that, that's a fairly common misconception. Right. Well, next time you run into your mom or uh, jump on the phone with her, ask her about phylloxera. Okay. And and the, the the New Orleans issue with uh, cognac because, and this is this is it's crazy how all of these events intertwine because phylloxera was a huge grape blight that hit France during the middle of the 1800s, and it just wiped out all the grapes. So if you ever hear of a mm-hmm. first growth Bordeaux, or if you hear of some of these winemakers that are making wine in South America, it's because they literally got freaked out, took these roots to South America to avoid this mm. phylloxera blight that was killing them off. And so that's why there's a couple of so, uh, Rothschild, Baron yeah. Rothschild owned places in South America that have these first growth vines because that's what they fled to. And that's when I believe it was green chartreuse got really popular because it was a sugar beet base Mm. distillate and there was a lot of scarcity in the grape based brandies Mm -hmm. and yellow chartreuse only came back on the scene. Yellow chartreuse is a grape base. It only came back on the scene after phylloxera Mm. had been kind of quashed. Oh, interesting. Uh, Some of that sounds vaguely familiar, but yeah, I, I, I was pretty, uh, absent on the the french history there that played into that but I, what i love about it is that like you know you're talking about Bert, like how all these spirits kind of waxed and waned based mm-hmm. on just all these outside factors like so bourbon came about a because we moved west of the appalachians just yep. slightly and because new orleans got thirsty yeah that's like a almost like a freak thing yeah no i mean it, again I mean, Pennsylvania could have dominated that market if they could have produced enough rye to, to send out there. And again, you said you mentioned Maryland, Maryland too. Uh, and there's again, there's plenty of rye being made now in uh, in the middle the middle states too. But uh, just historically speaking, and yeah, no, uh, again, I don't think there's anywhere that after the advent of distillation that hasn't had grain product and figured out how to turn it into an alcoholic beverage. Right. So, so when you have that much corn growing, it makes sense to make your whiskey out of corn. And uh, another great, great story. And this is, I guess on the rye side of things, but I mean, we're just up the road from, from Mount Vernon mm-hmm. and they've recreated the George Washington's, uh, former distillery there where he, for at least a year, was the largest rye producer in the country Mm -hmm. and that all got started because he hired a scotsman as his farm manager and the farm manager said we we should have a distillery and he convinced them and the great thing for him was again it comes back to commerce uh washington was was growing and milling all his wheat but all his great all his best wheat was getting shipped overseas which means that all of his money was tied up in trade and accounts payable, and he was not cash rich. When he started distilling, he didn't send his whiskey any further than Arlington, right? which is 20 miles up the road, right, right. and in cash in hand. It motivated him in a way <laughs> to, to say, yeah, no, we, we, we are going to keep distilling because, I mean, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the historical story of just about every large Virginia farm. They were always, I mean, land rich, crop rich, but but cash poor. And uh, distilling for for George Washington turned into the entrepreneurial enterprise that that made him really brilliant businessman that he was. 
Yeah, and so too for for all like all the farmers then mm. that then picked up roots and went west. Right. So we we've got the basic genesis of bourbon, I guess. And what I'm hoping you can do is tell us the story of the cocktail, right? Seems like that's a story that's that's going to kind of help us understand the transition between these and these these other spirits and then bourbon. And then what I what I'd like to talk about is, you know, how bourbon got to where it is today because i'd say today let, let's tip our hats to rye and say like yeah rye has had a huge resurgence but i'd say that today bourbon is the biggest brown spirit in america i think that if you're looking for a bar uh to do whiskey sipping in and you're talking about american spirits it's quite easily going to be bourbon there, there aren't although there's plenty of rye on bars out there a lot again it's it's predominantly focused towards cocktail culture so yeah bourbon i think in terms of sipping whiskey in america uh is 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 the king and there will be people who mention the fact that now we have a few really great american single malts and that's that's all new so Mm -hmm. i'll push that aside yeah so on the on the cocktail side of things i mean cocktails um, have a history. I mean, you can talk about things that are pr- kind of pre-cocktail that go back to uh, the early stages of the United States, but cocktail culture really doesn't start until uh, early to mid-1800s. Mm-hmm. And one thing that I think is fascinating there, too, is you have to realize how common it is to have what we call today craft or local spirits, because Back then, when the country was smaller, we still, I think sometime around the turn of the century, so 1900, the United States had 18,000 distilleries. Do you know what that number is? We're in the the highest resurgence since uh, post-prohibition, and there are 1,300 craft or small distillers. So say um, that again. So 18,000 18, versus 1300. 1, so we think we're, we think we're hitting some sort of peak now. And I will say, um, pre prohibition, uh, Americans were drinking about 10 times more in quantity than, than we do today. So maybe part of it's just the demand hasn't caught up yet, but, uh, <laughs> well, and I, you got to imagine that the, the manufacturing power yeah. of most distilleries today is m- far like, so, so you, you, that's another thing is the big ones are certainly much bigger than they were back then. So they're producing a lot and more. And the small and, ones are much bigger than the small yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. But but anyway, you had a bunch. Of, you had a bunch of small guys. Right. Uh, and you had a, well, you just had a bunch of guys in general. There were a bunch of people out there, and I mean, sorry, ladies, but it was mostly guys. But um, uh, out there producing um, producing spirits, whether legally or illegally. I mean, the the American heritage and moonshining is is also significant. And those people sold to taverns and bars and inns the same way that uh, the, the the regular guys did. They just did it under the table. So you've got this huge, huge supply of whiskey. And um, like anything, varying degrees of quality. And even some of the good quality stuff is still really high proof. And so cocktails really come about because most people, even today, don't like sipping neat spirits. Right. Um, and then you think about harsh neat spirits and you're like, oh, wow, nobody's ever going to buy one of those. And that's exactly what the bartenders and the innkeepers and the taverns thought was, I'll buy this. And people will certainly drink it because it's alcoholic. But, man, I'm going to have to cut it with stuff. And that's where, uh, I mean, really, that's old fashions, that's punches, mm-hmm. kind of the first on the scene. And then you have the advent of or the the pulling over of some old war world modifiers, uh, vermouths and, uh, you mentioned chartreuse, that sort of mm-hmm. thing that, I mean, and this is, I'm fast forwarding decades now, right, um, right, right. but We're probably in the 1880s at this point, but yeah, but it's that base foundation of a lot of this stuff was just hard to drink or for most people it was hard to drink. And so owners of drinking establishments had to find ways to make it more palatable. And again, punches, old fashions were, were classic ways. Um, Manhattan comes on the scene very early. Um, I'm thinking specifically of whiskey cocktails right now. I mean, we talked about New Orleans, the Sazerac mm-hmm, and the Vucare, right. the Vucare are both are both originally cognac drinks. Yep. Um, and and you'll even I, today. I I mean, a Vucare I, I like with rye, but you can make it with cognac just just the same. And 
I've actually made a Sazerac that's uh, split rye and or bourbon and 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 brandy and uh, there's some really good combinations there. But yeah, that's really what happens, and I think it's just an earlier stage of what you're seeing now is people's tastes change. You see, you see the market shift, not not in huge ways, but enough by the on the margin, away from from beer or or away from wine and into cocktails and you you start having a wealthier set of folks especially in metropolitan areas in, in the states i mean cocktail culture in the united states really was um big city i mean predominantly new york obviously new orleans a little san francisco but san francisco was huge and it uh, Philadelphia had its hand in it, yep. but I mean, it's metropolitan places where people had money to spend and, and the cocktail was really, I mean, we're, we're getting closer to what it was back then in, in a lot of places in the U S where it was almost an event or an experience, uh, the, the same way that people think about, especially millennials these days, apparently uh, think about food. Uh, it's not just sustenance. It's, it's an experience. It's, um, uh, it's to, to, some part luxury right. and and I think cocktails are, are certainly a part of that and I don't think the way that bourbon has a very kind of blue collar beginning I don't think cocktails have that I think cocktails have always been predominantly a a uh, upper class or mm -hmm. or when we're lucky middle class uh, a beverage and again you had all kinds of all kinds of cocktail culture up until uh, up until uh prohibition and then it all gets smashed and then we go through the cocktail dark ages which right. we're just now crawling out of well and so this is this is interesting to me because what so what you know e even during the, uh, the roaring 20s when cocktails were just you know the, the golden age of cocktails mm -hmm. let's say even you know even before the 20s they were really popular it was still mostly rye being used in these whiskey drinks so i i really like the country mouse city mouse kind of distinction that you're pulling here with bourbon and you know I, I i gotta in in a cocktail dark age like prohibition you know where do you go where do you go to hide you go to the hollers you go yeah. to the woods yeah and you survive there and i really love the the blue collar history of of bourbon you know i think it can sometimes slightly detract from it in terms of being a respected cocktail spirit because bourbon's a great cocktail spirit well, yeah no it is it absolutely is but I, one again we're just now i mean we're just now coming out of uh, what i call the dark ages and i, I derek brown who's a, a fantastic bar owner here in town and also uh, he has a, he has a some sort of honorary or real role I, i'm gonna offend him by calling it honorary role at a, <laughs> the, the national archives about cocktail history and and that sort of thing and it's the whole rye thing is again as a product of what was supplied i i think that pre-prohibition rye was still do the dominant piece there again it's not like prohibition stopped and then all of a sudden everybody appreciated cocktails again we went deck i mean distilleries moved back a lot of something that i didn't know until a few years ago was when prohibition hit a lot of those stills in kentucky um so specifically bourbon, I know specifically about bourbon, but I think it's true of distilleries across the country. The ones that had the money to picked up their stills and moved to Mexico. Mm. Um, and they, they either started production down in Mexico um, or they just held them there knowing or hoping that the law would get reversed and mm. they could come back and stills came back. And uh, again, though, uh, I think that prohibition uh, did... Uh, significant damage on the psyche of Americans and their drinking habits. And I think that um, it influenced the business model in a way that was um, moved us towards uh, big and conglomerate because the ones who had the cash on hand to withstand years of, of prohibition are the ones that jumped up and started acquiring all the old equipment, all the other spaces of, of the folks who couldn't make it. And so you had, I mean, this is true of the beer world also. I mean, 85% of the market in beer is, is controlled by two companies. So it, that's just a, a, a natural product of it. And then, I mean, you couldn't get a good cocktail. I mean, I wasn't ordering cocktails in the 80s, but you couldn't get a good cocktail in the 80s or 90s. I mean, 
it didn't it didn't exist it wasn't until i mean it hasn't been 15 years of of american cocktail resurgence uh i mean in the 90s maybe the best cocktail you could have gotten was a was a cosmo and if you know my opinion about a cosmo you know that's not a good thing yeah so <laughs> it's not a compliment um, like uh, so i don't i'm rambling again well no i think you make a good point in that like all right so we've got these we've got these truly American spirits. We've got rye whiskey, we've got bourbon. Both of them were very, very damaged by what happened during Prohibition. But another thing that happened during the early part of the 20th century is something that I want to talk about here because a lot of regulation happened during that time. And and, and people, for good reasons or maybe not good reasons, started demanding that people started putting things on labels and, and they started inspecting distillers and their products to make sure that these label claims were correct. And that's one of the things that I want people to come out of this episode with, because we've got several, we've got five bottles in front of us here, and we're going to do some tastings in, in a moment. But what I want to move on to now, now that we kind of know the history and have kind of traced things back from literally George Washington with mm-hmm. his rye all the way up through the dark ages and, and now into the light. But how did some of these label claims such as bottled in bond or straight whiskey. How did these come about? Why should I care as a consumer? And if there's some reason why I should care, how do I go into the liquor store and know that there's some value being conveyed? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think that I'll take the bottle and bond piece first. Yeah. I think that that is, I think bottled and bond is a great example of well-constructed consumer protections. Again, you had a lot of essentially home distillers. I mean, really small shops, whatever, uh, even big shops, but they're selling stuff basically out their front door to uh, to bars and, and everyone else with very little oversight as to the quality or the proof of of the alcohol. Um, so you could you could tell I mean it's the same thing as when somebody the best equivalent I can have that anybody that's listening now will will recognize as having happened is when you order a mixed drink at a bar and you get one that's watery you know it's watery and when you get a strong one you know it's strong but you don't really know exactly how much of whatever is supposed to be in there to qualify as a, a, as a good drink and and you don't know unless you have an opinion and but there's no standard. You don't you don't get to ask the bartender, well, how long was that that spray from the the soda hose or or whatever? And right. And you, you just don't know. You don't know how much ice they put in it versus another one. The same thing was going on in the whiskey world. You didn't know what they were putting in it. You didn't know how much alcohol was actually there. And it was literally the jug with so, the three yeah. X's on yes, it yeah, that we no, associate. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's the jug with the three X's on it. And I mean, bottled and bond was first and foremost, and to this day is the the best value add for a consumer is that it guaranteed a hundred proof. So it it guaranteed 50% alcohol. It came with other stipulations. It it had to be, it it also has to, for to be bottled and bond, it also has to be produced in one uh, distillation season by one distiller. Uh, I'm going to look at cheating, look at my notes. Um, and it has to have been aged for more than four years to be bottled in bond. Interesting. And if, yeah. And so, so to that degree, the, the fact that a consumer knows those facts, it does tell you something up front. Now, bourbon has to be 51% corn, has to be aged in new charred oak, and has to be a com- only a, a grain mash bill. So no fruit. So no fruit, cereal grains. And, but it doesn't have, it's, it needs to be aged in new charred oak, meaning it can't come from a barrel that's been used for anything else before. Um, and just but, a sidebar here, that's why the American bourbon industry actually makes a significant amount of money by shipping off their barrels to especially scotch producers mm-hmm. because scotch producers don't have that per very particular regulation on them. And so that's where they all go after they get used one time. But it doesn't ha- there's no, nothing in the law that suggests how much time something has to be aged 
in in new charred oak for it to be bourbon so literally uh, just wash it through so, the barrel so you, leave you it can overnight. You, you can you could basically pump it in and pump it out the other side and say that it was it was aged in the process of, of going through the barrel and and so there there's some safeguards there bottled and bond is four years uh you mentioned straight whiskey straight so straight bourbon is that it's got to be over two years okay and if it's under four it has for, for it to be straight if it's under four it also has to have the age statement on there so right and and for straight it can't have any any additives um so again back in the good old days and even today you have whiskeys that do this and, and bourbons that do this is adding adding sugars adding flavors uh whatever else there's only one loophole that I, I think you get in that where it's not just you have your bourbon, you put it in the barrel, you take it out of the barrel, you might add water to it to cut it down to proof. So there's other technical pieces of, of straight where it has to go into, it can't be distilled above 80%, so 160 proof. Right. It can't put be put in the barrel above, I think it's like... 62 and a half percent or something like that um and then and then but that's obviously that's 120 proof most most of the whiskey you get is 80 to to 95 um right so people are are always cutting that with water Uh, that that's normal and appropriate and we'll actually talk about some of the high proof stuff we have on the table later Yeah, yeah, yeah um and tasting it but any other, any other additives? So again, sugars, other liquors, uh, caramels, that's what was, can, caramel flavors. Like yeah. um, they're actually. I was just at a whiskey convention a, a month or two ago, and somebody had. Uh, it was a historical kind of booth, and somebody had these old things that looked like bouillon cu- cubes, but they said rye whiskey flavor. Oh no! And and like I don't know if there was a bourbon flavor one, but like they had these little like pills basically for people to drop into their alcohol that would like enhance the whiskey flavors. Um, oh, man. And, and so like that stuff was going on. So bottled and bond and straight, I uh, come out of like n- labeling something straight whiskey, come out of the need for some consumer protection, some consumer knowledge, that sort of thing. I, I think I got through all the technical bits. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I, I mean, I, that I, I, I like about it is that, okay, so maybe you're not the kind of person who necessarily wants something that's going to be 50% alcohol or more. So maybe bottle it and bond is not your game, but at the very least having something that says on the label, a straight bourbon whiskey, mm-hmm. at least, you know, that there was some regulation going on there. And so it's, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not something that dictates my decision, mm-hmm. but it's something that maybe confirms a decision. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, so nothing, and, and this is goes, this is going to go into a couple of more terms cause I, uh, I do want to talk about the marketing, um, yeah, and, let's, and, let's piece and, and, and the transparency for, for folks is nothing about bottled and bond, nothing about straight whiskey makes it good or bad whiskey. They are labels that talk to process and, and to, again, to some measurable, qualifications for, for the whiskey, how much alcohol is in it and how long it's been aged, that sort of thing. But it doesn't tell you that it's good. Um, right. And the same way that, again, just had a conversation last night about uh, craft spirits and, and what craft means. And craft doesn't mean, I mean, it's marketed as quality or suggested as quality. Right. If, um, you're, if you're smaller than, and if you but, hand apply your labels, then chances are you mm-hmm. pay more attention to your juice. So right. that, that's the implication, right? Right. Yeah, I think so. But but there's plenty of craft out there that's garbage. There's plenty of I I mean I don't know a bottled and bond that I think is 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 swill. I think that everything I've tasted that's bottled and bond is is pretty good, but I think that's also just the legacy of the label and and people making sure that what they're putting under bond is is good. And then straight whiskey uh, um again, nothing necessitates that. I think it tends to be true that it's it's better than I mean, on average, if you took non-straight whiskeys and and, and straight whiskeys, I, I think that they're better. And it also signifies that it's a purity of product. And I think that that's something of, of pretty high value. The things that really get people hung up in the bourbon world, especially, is, is bourbon actually does a pretty good job of, or the laws uh, require a certain amount of transparency. And, and it does, the laws themselves do a pretty good job of, 
of providing that transparency that's needed. It doesn't mean that people aren't don't try to mislead or, or, or be dishonest. And the, the, the one that people get hung up on the most is they get sold a really great story under an old label that has a story about pre-prohibition, that sort of thing. And then they're buying a 10-year whiskey from a two-year-old distillery. And maybe it's after the third drink at home and they're thinking, wait, how, 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 did, that, yeah. how did that happen? And they find out that that two-year distillery has been sourcing their bourbon from, from somewhere else. Now, again, it might impact you because you got sold the story. Right. But, like, yes. So but, what? It's, but, it's still like it was but, good for the but, first two drinks. But if, it's, but if it's good juice, it's good juice. And you should appreciate I, In my opinion, you should appreciate it for that. Right. I also think that I, very, I, I put a high value in distilleries and distillers and bottles being honest about what's in the bottle. So if I feel like there's a distillery that's been particularly dishonest about the good juice that's in the bottle, I might not go back for that second bottle, that sort of thing. Sure. Just out of, there's plenty of good stuff out there. Let's support the folks who are doing their best to be straightforward about it. So uh, when you're looking at a bottle of bourbon, they are required to tell you what state it's distilled in. They are required to tell you what state it's bottled in. If, if they don't do that, then uh, then they're, they're, they're cheating the system somehow. A lot of times you'll see distilled and bottled. If they don't designate, if they somehow combine it all into like one term, it usually means that it's been produced. And I, you see produced, and produced is misleading because it all often say distilled somewhere and produced somewhere else, which is... I don't know what you're producing other than pouring it into a bottle or, right. or <laughs> but, some filtration. Yeah. Oh, so, so that's another thing is there's a lot of great sourced uh, bourbon out there. Source meaning somebody, so source, so meaning, somebody else made so, it. So meaning, meaning that, uh, that a company like uh, Bullet, uh, which is Stitzel Weller, uh, people love their rye and their, their bourbon. Stitzel Weller is just coming back online. I don't know where they are in the process of actually having stills, but they've um, that's that's source whiskey. Um, they they bought it from somebody else, somebody who produces whiskey on contract, basically, mm -hmm. and and then sells it either by the barrel or by project. And there are a few of them. MGP is a, is a big one in Indiana, and it it produces the vast. I mean. If it's a source dry in the United States, which there's a lot of source dry out there, it probably came from MGP. There are a few other spots it could have come from. But, um, and then other, some other big distilleries um, that have their own labels uh, sell barrels out of their rickhouses on a regular basis. Yep. Uh, normal practice, it shouldn't be discouraged. Uh, and, and the thing is, you do get, you get some small distilleries that are doing this, that are sourcing their whiskey, and essentially cut it down to proof and put it in a bottle, and that's it. Right. You have others that continue to age, and they try to put their fingerprints they, on they, it. They try to put their words. finger. They put it. In, they they buy the barrels. They put them in their rick house for an additional couple of years. Um, they probably have their own master blender, so they have somebody in there who's picking the barrels that are then being blended together and turned into a bottle. Most, and that goes into another. Well, I'll go ahead and use that as the segue into another term, which is single barrel, um, okay. or 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 small batch. Single barrel means exactly what it sounds like. Right. Uh, that that juice came from a single barrel, and and that's great. Um, I, I oftentimes single barrel projects are are also sold at higher proof. Those are those are bourbons that I tend to appreciate a great deal because they've mm -hmm. also been selected as kind of premium barrels. You're not doing a single barrel project with the bad barrels. Exactly. In, in, in those are the ones else. you want to mix in. Um, uh, right. So. So you, the, the, the person in charge of the business end of this has identified those barrels as particularly good. Um, so usually that's a, a single barrel is, generally speaking, a solid indication that it's, it's good whiskey. Or, again, some of these young guys that are cash rich uh, might put a project out there that, that isn't fantastic or, or maybe not worth the price point. But uh, generally speaking, you're going to get a good whiskey there and, and probably at a little higher proof. Right. And then you have small batch. And to be honest, I don't think that there is a technical limit on the number of barrels um, that go into small batch. And if you're talking about a small batch from a craft, a craft small distiller and small batch from 
a bigger distiller. Um, we, I mean, we have four roses and, and Elijah Craig on the table, both small batches. Right. I don't remember the numbers, but I can tell you f- with a high degree of certainty that there are significantly more barrels in a bottle of Elijah Craig small batch than there are in, in four roses. Right. Um, again, it means something. It means that they were selected for a specific flavor profile. They weren't just kind of pulling an entire row off of a rickhouse and, and blending all those barrels kind of without without thought. And again, all these distilleries are looking for consistency. Right. Um, uh, all the major prod, Woodford Reserve, um, their standard release, Buffalo Trace, Maker's Mark, all of these guys are, are producing a consistent project product and the way they do that is by blending these barrels and having somebody with an immaculate palate that can say we need to go three degrees this direction we need to go three degrees that direction right. of flavor and, right, right. and and get something great um, so small batch is another term that you see out there that again it means something it means somebody put some thought into the a smaller number of barrels than generally are used into uh, what should is often a few points higher on the price point and uh and maybe noticeably better than whatever the, the rung down is for them. Um, uh, again, we have two different bottles of Four Roses on the table. I've, yep. I've always said that everything top to bottom, and they, they really have three product lines that they, they sell. And then one's their yellow label. It's an 80 proof bottle that sometimes comes in plastic, if I remember right. <laughs> I, usually buy it, I usually buy it in a glass half gallon. Um, yep. um, but it's, it's great cocktail. It's great cocktail bourbon. I, I, I use it a lot. I can't say that I sip on it much, but when I do, I sip on it over a, 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 a handful of small ice and it, it works out just fine. Right. Both the, I love the small batch for, for cocktails. I think it's, I mean, I'm sipping on it now. It's, it's an excellent standalone whiskey that I can sip on or, or mix cocktails with. So it's a fairly versatile bottle and it's right. relatively cheap. It retails at like $30, I think in DC, you sometimes have to pay 40 for it. Um, yes. and then, and then there's their single barrel project is oftentimes retails for 40 and in DC you had to pay a little bit more for it. Right. I think um, I got that for 48 or 50 um, and, uh, and it's but, been, I've had it for a year and a half now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, but so going through those terms, the things that as a consumer, I'd tell you to look at first is if, if you're, if you're learning your preferences, pay attention to proof. I think proof m- means a lot, especially when you're first getting started. Sometimes the high proof whiskeys um, mask a lot of the flavors because what you're doing is um, when you're developing your palate, you're just getting that burst of alcohol on the front end and you're burning your nostrils and you're not going to taste much else or as much as you could otherwise. Right. So two solutions to that. Start with lower proof stuff and work your way up. When your palate gets well developed and you can start pulling out those nuances or buy the higher proof stuff and also buy a, um, a bottle or, uh, or a gallon of uh, a distilled water. A gallon right. will last you forever because what you want to do is take an eyedropper. A lot of uh, bitters come in uh, these days. Use something like that that's uh, clean and sterile and, and fill that with distilled water. And yep. then just add a drop or two of distilled water into some high proof stuff. And it really opens it up. It allows uh, the al- alcohol vapors to dissipate a little bit mm-hmm. and and does legitimately cut the proof. Uh, you're going to need to add more than a couple drops to drop the proof much. But again, it it's doing things to open up that whiskey and that whiskey flavor for you that uh, might might mean you appreciate it more if, if what you're trying to do is is find those nuances. I like the um, <clears throat> the distinctions that you drew between some of those label claims. And I think... There's probably two types of people out there, right? Somebody who's looking to get the best deal and somebody who's just looking not to get screwed over. Mm -hmm. I think if you're looking not to get screwed over, I think the best thing that you can do as you're looking at the wall of bourbons is that you can, I think, and I think the Four Roses is a perfect example. You're going to have the yellow label, which is their basic project. You're going to see the price point on that. You're going to see the the small batch be a little bit more expensive. You're going to see the single barrel be, you know, probably significantly more expensive. And so really all you should be doing if you don't want to get screwed over is you know what you're looking for. You know that those bottles are probably increasing in quality, smoothness, nuance as you go up in price, as you go from the regular, probably straight, there's the yellow label is probably a straight bourbon whiskey. Uh, I don't think it's, bo- it's not bonded cause it's not, it's not bo- no, it's not bonded. Um, 
So it's probably it's, a it's probably, it's probably Kentucky straight. It's probably Kentucky straight bourbon. So as you go from the straight to the small batch to the single barrel, and you know, then even you know, smaller projects would be like a cask strength, mm -hmm. which is even right. stronger and even you know, even smaller batch. Then you know, you if you're just trying not to get screwed over, then don't worry too much about it. You know where you want to be, just mm -hmm. be there. But if you're if you're looking to get the best deal possible, then you're really gonna want to you know examine some of these claims like. All right. Does it say produced and bottled, or distilled and bottled, or does it say that it's you know just so, bottled by? Yeah. Right. Right. Because if you see like to me that's a red flag. If you see a bourbon that yeah. just says bottled by, then it's like a pretty clear indication. And and you know newsflash those those claims are not going to be in big bold letters. No, no, they're not. Those are going to be in little tiny letters yeah. right on the back of the bottle. No. What 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 what? And I think this goes across all all liquor and and. But again, because of the regulation in whiskey, it's certainly true there. What they're proud of is in big font. What they're not proud of is in small font. And generally that holds true. Uh, sometimes right. they just have small font because they're trying to fit way too many words on a bottle. But yeah, I think the biggest thing right now in front of me, you can't see because the bottles are facing different, is the 12 on the Elijah Craig mm. small batch. So that, and that's, that's actually another great, great point to bring up is age statements in, in whiskey because people put. I think way too much stock in age statements. So for a bourbon or for any whiskey to have an age statement, what it means is again, we talked about mixing barrels. It means that mm -hmm. the youngest barrel in that bottle is what's on that age statement. So it can be blended higher. So you could have, again, this says Elijah Craig 12 year. You could have an 18 year old bourbon in here, but it's mixed with at least a 12 and and nothing lower age statements are important when you i think when you get down to the lower numbers where you're not talking about the the fanciest highest priced whiskeys when you're talking about the two to four year olds when you're talking about five six to eight i um i think there's a generally speaking i think there's a huge jump between four and eight years that's not necessarily true of eight to twelve right. um mm -hmm. and and same true with zero to four <laughs> in, in a very noticeable way. But age statements get a lot of, and, and to the point where if Elijah Craig, and this is a perfect example, Elijah Craig small batch has now removed the age statement. And the bourbon nerd community blew up about it. Uh, claims about quality going down and flavor going down and, and, and all these things. And that may come to pass it hasn't yet i've had plenty of elijah craig small batch that doesn't have the age statement on it and i think what they said in their release when they took that off was that they were going to blend things um still uh, no younger than nine year eight or nine years i think is, is what they said and it was still going to be predominantly close to that 12 year range but because of the bourbon boom they just didn't have in sure in inventory enough to keep the brand going at that at that age statement again perfectly good whiskey it may who knows maybe in six more years it means something different if they're dropping it even further in age but right now it's it, i'd be hard pressed to to say that i notice a difference and if I did notice a difference that I could attribute it to younger barrels. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, and the general wisdom is right. If it, the longer it stays in the barrel, then the smoother it is, the mm -hmm. more nuanced it is. Um, Until you get it way up there. Yeah. Again, you get a lot of like scotch is known for having 20 plus year um, scotches from personal experience. There are some really great, wonderful, interesting things in bourbon that are 20 to 25 years there's also some really really funky stuff <laughs> that you either appreciate because it's different and novel and funky or you just recognize it's crap um <laughs> like and and so there's i mean there really is uh the risk of that when you get to higher higher age stuff with with bourbon i think the the, the oak can can play some mean tricks on a bourbon between ages 16 and, and 22 uh, <laughs> and, yep. and uh so some of it again some of it turns out like gold and some of it doesn't i just don't think that i think that you can have some general idea about what an age a certain aged bourbon means flavor profile wise what more comes out after again the difference between a four year and an eight year and a 12 year but and where that kind of leads it but but again speaking to quality um I like a lot of stuff that's 
in the eight to 12 year range. Sure. Um, I've had some really great six year stuff. I've had some good four year stuff. And then honestly, when I start thinking about stuff that's younger than that, I start thinking about it as young whiskey. I, right. I, so I'm drinking it for a different, uh, aiming at a different target. Sure. Um, but yeah, different expectations. Yeah. yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, some mad bourbon knowledge by Jordan Wicker, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2018.